So 2012, you got a nomination for Food and Wine Magazine, yeah. People's uh, Best Chef. Yeah. Um, how awesome was that? It was, was cool, and we we tried to do a whole campaign around it. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, right then is kind of when I think Texas showed up, and Texas is incredibly. You're listening to the Bar and Restaurant Podcast, where hospitality lovers come to listen and learn with expert David DiLorenzo. Now here's your host, the DiLo. What's cooking for it, O-Fam? We are back with another episode of the Bar and Restaurant Podcast, brought to you by the local 480. I am your host, the DLO. As usual, we're coming at you today with another tasty episode featuring our guest for today's show is Justin Beckett, Chef Justin Beckett. Um, Justin's been in the Valley um, for quite a while. He's opened a few restaurants with uh, his wife and, and a few other friends of theirs and we get to dig into this episode we hear about their story we hear about you know Justin's uh, upbringing and beginnings and and you know his um, commitment to family and his commitment to just cooking good local food and creating a great and uh, very hospitable atmosphere for people to come to so um, enough talking for now let's dig in uh, first I want to give a real quick shout out to our show sponsors barn restaurant insurance Insurance is boring, but your bar and restaurant business shouldn't be. So get the best insurance protection from the insurance professionals that know how to protect your business so that you can keep the food and drinks flowing. Another sponsor that I'm really happy and excited to have on board is Paylocity. So with Paylocity, it was really cool for them to you know come on and, and be a part of this podcast and, and some other things that we're doing. And so um, they are all about simplifying how you perform it with industry leading technology and customer service. So with that being said, let's uh, get on with the podcast. And we are here today with Justin Beckett of Beckett's Table and Southern Rail. Good morning. Good to see you, brother. How are you? Yeah, I'm great. Um, this is really cool for me because we know of each other. We've met several times. I've seen you at Devour. I've seen you at a lot of other types of food festivals and places like that. And uh, we kind of reconnected and got to know each other a little bit more on a personal level, um, especially to the fact where it's more comfortable to where a lot of times restaurant tours, and I get it because dealing with a lot of them, they always feel like there's a, some sort of back end solicitation or anything like that. And so we were talking about something that was really more passionate and driven towards the restaurant industry and that was about employees and and we'll get into that in a little bit but it was cool to connect with you and just kind of wrap out with you so i'm like why don't you just come on and do my podcast and yeah. without hesitation you're like yeah let's do this this sounds like fun so <laughs> i got suckered in immediately right yeah, yeah. You, you certainly did so um i'm excited to talk to you and and let our audience know a lot a bit about you and okay. and then some um so born in san francisco yeah i was born uh, actually in the mission um and, you know, I was born in the hospital, San Francisco General Hospital there, but, but since then, none of my other siblings have been born in hospitals. So it was kind of interesting how my mother's kind of hippie style of life, kind of, <laughs> you know, her evolution basically got out of that world. But yeah, I was born in San Francisco wow. and, um, and I lived on, up and down the peninsula for a good chunk of my life. Um, and then, you know, Washington State, down to Guatemala, I mean, kind of all up and down the coast, a little bit in Canada. And then we kind of moved out to Hawaii, and I went to part of high school, and, and then I finished high school in Sacramento, and I ended up at the California Culinary Academy in San Francisco for, for, yeah. for culinary school. So back to being a kid, when did all of this, you know, cooking and, and really being um, just like involved with food, when did this start? Well, I, I remember so vividly the kitchen that, um, quote unquote, my job started to help, you know, help mom. I'm the oldest of five kids. Yeah. So, and there's six years between me and the next one. So when my mom said, where do you want to help? What do you want to do? I need you. I, I kind of chose the kitchen. And it was, you know, it was horrible burnt brown rice and, and, <laughs> and bad tofu and, and you know, soups and, and, and pasta dinners that were awful. Yeah. But for me, um, it, I don't know that the chemistry of it made sense or the feel of it made sense. But it, it, it just kind of felt like the spot in the house I should be. Right. So that was... Um, that was in third and fourth grade. So okay. It was, it was very, very early that I started doing that. And then my first paying cooking job was eighth grade. And I was, you know, dishwashing and peeling shrimp and assembling sandwiches and making fresh pasta. So for me, it's always kind of been part of it. Weren't you a, a, a bar back at a nightclub or something after that? Or what? Um, the the restaurant, one of the first restaurants that I worked at was called Casanova's. And it's yeah. In a, it's in a, a country um, on Maui. 
and it turned into a bar, you know, nightclub. And okay. sometimes I'd have to stay late, which my mom didn't appreciate because I was <laughs> going to school right. um, in eighth grade. And uh, I think the looking back on it, the part that I think was kind of lucky or unlucky, however you want to look at it, is there was this this, this hustle and this bustle, you know, of, of the the bartenders and the cocktail servers and everyone coming back and you know emptying the glasses and throwing the ice. Yeah. And, you know, all this kind of commotion that kind of got it got its hooks in me early, and I think that's part of what led to. You got you the the restaurant disease, yeah. yeah. The um, disease. So you you have mm-hmm. obvi- okay. So you have these siblings, and and none of them are in the restaurant business whatsoever. Or? Actually, my my sister is the younger of the two sisters is uh, actually a general manager in San Francisco at a restaurant. Oh, okay. Yeah. You ever get to go back out there and see her? And well, we we used to take a lot of trips out there a couple times a year. Yeah. My wife and I, and and even the kids to kind of see the old stomping grounds, but that slowed down a little bit. Um, but it is, you know, when I go to a city like that, it's a commitment. You know, it's a right. thon It's a it's a big vacation or something like that. So, I don't know. We don't get back as much as I'd as like. As much as you'd like to. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so you're going to culinary school there. And basically, when did you leave um, California and, and come out to Arizona? So, after culinary school, I got a job at the, uh, the Inn at Spanish Bay. And uh, I was working at Roy's there. And I was there for about 14 months or so. So, we're talking... 97 ish. Okay. And, um, and they came to me and they said, we got the franchise rights for Roy's in Arizona and we have this investor in this, this restaurant tour who wants to do them. Do you want to move down there? And I was, you know, I was 21 and didn't, right. didn't have any commitments. Um, and so I said, of course, sure. Yeah. I'd love to go down. So I came down as an opening chef to do the, the different locations here in the Valley. Where was the first Roy's? Uh, Indian Bend and Scottsdale Road. Oh my God. I remember the that. Of the, yeah. Seville, center right is across from the train park yeah which we're with chris is right. now and yep. okay yep. so um we opened that in i think it was december of 98 97 okay like or january of 98 um and it just crushed, crushed i it. mean yeah. 450 covers every night and just crazy amounts of volume and you're 21 and, at this time and i'm 21 yeah and we had a great i mean tons and tons of cooks and staff and yeah. corporate trainers and all that stuff so it was it was a really great opening experience but that was kind of the beginning of, you know, my my real kind of in charge cooking style. Yeah, you felt like it was your own. It was almost like your own restaurant. Yeah, sense. and I've always treated everyone's restaurant as that I worked at, you know, like it was my own. And I think that's a good trait for for sure for anyone who wants to become a leader. Right, and including your own restaurants, you've opened up eighteen. Is that eighteen? Southern Rail was eighteenth restaurant I've opened. That's awesome. Yeah, that's well, a lot. By it, the way, it, that like. In dog years, that like, like four or five years. Of time. That's like two thousand restaurants in dog years. So no commitments. Obviously, when you're opening up Roy's, you are married, and your wife is in business with you here in, in Southern Rail. When did when did you all meet, and how did that happen? So we met um, actually on August thirtieth, and the reason I know that's my sister's birthday. We met at Raw um, up in Kierland. Happy anniversary! Thank you. And it was a mutual going, af- going away, uh, mutual friends going away party. Okay. And she was actually being set up on a blind date. Um, with somebody else? With someone else. Ah. And uh, we got to talking and we just have not stopped talking for Ever you since. Know, 15 years. So it's, <laughs> it's been, it's been really great. Uh, we actually all left as a group that night and I was deathly afraid of walking across, you know, the, the group of people and saying, Hey, can I have your number? So I'd ask a friend to ask her sister, to ask her friend, to ask oh, her friend, you know, to, to, to get her number. Yeah. So, but it ended up working out. And how old were you when you guys met? Oh, uh, I was, um, so that was, uh, 2004. Yeah. 2003. Okay. So that's cool. Kid. And, and you guys are in business together. So like, how was that? Does that work really well? You guys, well, she's really one of the greatest attributes, uh, in of her brain and her life is she's really good at all the things that I'm not especially great at. Yeah. So, and, and really good at some of the things that I am good at also, but she, she tends to run the ship of, you know, all the things that I don't get to, I can't get to, I don't know how to get to. Right. And she kind of pushes that forward into the four of our plates, you know, and then and keeps the ball rolling. So keeps it going. it's an incredible support system. Um, she's also a beaming, shining face in the restaurants. Yeah. You know? So when she's in here, um, well, fun, quick, quick, fun yeah. story. Um, when I when we opened this place, I, I had big britches, and I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, first <laughs> restaurant and, and all this stuff, and big deal and all that. And people would come in, and on a nightly basis, they'd be like, "Is Michelle Beckett here?" You know, and I'd be like, "Kidding? What are you <laughs> well, talking about? I'm like, cooking I'm here." <laughs> and so she's uh, 
she's a big deal in this town. She she was yeah. a teacher for many years. She knows a lot of families. She knows a lot of people. So it's it's a really great community to involve in her restaurants as well. She's definitely the face. Um, and especially when I come here, I'll see her doing pictures for social media. She'll be touching tables. I mean, even out at the events at Devour, yeah. just really, really, really sweet. So that's cool. Um, and it, it's really nice to have a husband and wife couple paired with a husband and wife couple. Yes. The four of us really balance each other out. And, and you know, Scott and Katie on a daily basis have their their duties i have my duties michelle has hers and we kind of all just conquer yeah what we need to conquer do everything us, together yeah. before we get into scott and katie let's talk about you have two kids you have two boys tobin and grayson yep. and nine and eleven still or mm -hmm. okay but a few more days you know grayson will correct you and tell you that he's Almost 12. Almost you know, 12, yeah. of course. They're, they're at that. Those are great ages, yes, by the way. Yeah. I have two kids, 15 and 17. Yeah. So let me just you forewarn just you. It. Your water bill will go up pretty oh, soon. Yeah, yeah, those showers get longer. Um, but anyways, what, what are the boys into? Um, <clears throat> they love books. They love reading. They get that from Michelle. Okay. She's the, she's the smart one of the two. But um, they, are, they are heavily involved in school. They love, they love being there. Yeah. Um, uh, Grace and most recently is extremely involved in YouTube. He is just, you know, he has his own channel. Ah. He wants to talk about it all the time. So he might be a little social media guy in the works. That's great. Uh, and then Tobin loves to read. They both love Legos. They love movies. Um, you know, Grayson loves fantasy football, which we just started. Uh, really? So they've been in, I think this is the fifth year that they've, I've, I've been kind of hosting the kids league. Okay, so they have so a they kids have, league. Yeah, they're up to ten man league now. What do they win? Like a six pack? Or? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> we uh, we do shots of Jaeger. Shots that's of Jaeger. <laughs> no, uh, they um, they well, there's a small trophy that they pass around, but mostly it's cool. bragging rights between their friends. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I ask the dads and the moms to not get involved. I mean, if they come and they say, "Hey, I can't figure out how to put this person in the lineup," you know, they right. can help, but they should not be saying, "Hey, you need to go pick up so and so because so and so got hurt." You know, that's the kids' job. To yeah. Research. Basically, don't be a dick. Let the kids right, exactly. have a good... Absolutely. Just like that. Do, are, do the kids have any interest in cooking, or do they do some stuff with you at the house, or ever come in here and want to... No, I mean, we used to do breakfast stuff together, so pancakes and french yeah. toast and stuff like that. But they are not... Um, they're not super adventurous eaters, and they don't love... They don't love, um, you know, going way outside the boat. But yeah. Michelle's taken it upon herself lately to kind of surprise them with flavors you know whether it be just sneaking some lime juice or some ginger or something into the to the normal dinner if you will um, gotcha. that way they get used to a little bit more but you no know, they're pretty they're pretty plain jane eaters and and i was too as a kid i mean yeah. i didn't eat anything so was know, I. until 10th grade or something so do you guys go out to eat a lot as a family or do you mainly cook when you i mean because you're cooking all the time so i yeah. assume uh, monday nights are usually our night together and, and now with sports and stuff all started up we don't go out as much as i would like to yeah um but they do they do love going out every once in a while you know i find out takeouts a little bit easier just to keep everyone home and bedtimes and you know that kind of stuff so for sure you know, dad life yeah dad life um, <laughs> but i don't cook enough at home i mean i cook here all day and then you know i get home and she's like what do you want for dinner and i'm like i don't know Richardson's. Right. Yeah. <laughs> something we can go, you know, not yeah. have to mess up the dishes and all mm -hmm. that. No, I get you. Well, going back to um, Katie and Scott. Now, yep. these are these are friends of yours that you guys just had befriended over time or whatever. And yeah. you were sitting there and having a beer and all of a sudden it's like, hey, why don't we do this ourselves? I mean, literally almost exactly like that. Yeah. So <laughs> um, uh, roundabout, I mean, Scott and Katie and myself had been acquaintances for a while and kind of run in circles and Carvels and Merck Bar and Roy's and you know kind oh, yeah. of all all the old the old stomping grounds. Um, but but for me, I think um, you know Scott and I actually went and had a beer and a burger at Deluxe, and we were both kind of in similar situations where what we were doing was kind of coming to an end. Yeah. Um, so he was in custom high end wine cellar uh, production and building um, and wine sourcing, and uh, Katie was flying for Southwest Airlines and she still does, um, but. And I was finishing up and we kind of sat down and said, you know, is there, is there something here? You know, is, is, is this something we would want to do together? Right. And we both agreed. Yes. So Michelle was, I can't remember if she was pregnant. I don't think she was pregnant at the time. And we all went over to, or we went over to my house and we drank three or four bottles of wine and wrote down everything we thought a restaurant should be or should encapsulate yeah. or should have qualities of. And four or five pages later and a couple of bottles of wine, you know, we woke up the next day and we're like, this has legs. Like these are these are important parts of the restaurant business to us. Yeah, and we don't see them a whole lot in Arizona at the time. So, it's amazing how many business plans have been written over alcohol. Yeah, which is 
asinine. I mean, that's a ridiculous right. conversation, right? Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, uh, many artists back in the day would tell you that you cannot produce anything without being slightly intoxicated, right? Well, so, you think Dream On was done sober? Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Or any great music? Yeah. yeah. Any, you know, any Tool album, you know, yeah, they right. weren't high. I mean, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, no, that's cool. Well, so you guys started uh, Beckett's Table 2010? Mm -hmm. Okay. October 27th. Yeah, and then Southern Rail opened? Yep, uh, about four years later. Okay. So. so in the process of opening up Becca's Table, obviously having some initial success and, you know, feeling good about it and this and that, you had gotten an opportunity over at the at the Newton. How did, how did that happen? Who approached you? And So I got a phone call from, um, from Craig over at Upward, and mm -hmm. he said, uh, you want to talk to these people. These people are some interesting people. So we, we sat down with John and Lorenzo and Leatrice and... Um, and they said, you know, our idea is to purchase this property and to take it apart like toothpicks and leave as much as we can and put it back together and keep the history and the nostalgia and the, the bones yeah. um, and not bleed it and pour new concrete and just start over. And we said, you know, that's really interesting because that's kind of our, our same wavelength. That's how we feel and how we think. Um, and then they said, but a really important component for us is that the tenants are actually um, partners. So when we went into the property, we went into it with two hats. We had a landlord hat and we had a tenant hat. Yeah. We had an investor hat. We had, you know, um, a, a redeveloper, a kind of like a, a respectful, artistic way of taking something apart, putting it back together while respecting history. Right. So that part was really super interesting. And, and uh, then we went and walked it. And uh, there were homeless people living in there and there were... <laughs> um, paraphernalia everywhere and they, we had to have cops kind of walk us through before just in case something got unsavory oh my goodness. and it was like I, I, I know this is kind of a joke but it was like Blair Witch Project like oh. the final scene of Blair Witch Project like walking through there it was literally <laughs> that yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. but uh, the funny thing was on the drive back we were all like we have to do this project this makes so much sense and having partners like changing hands yeah. like Gardner, um, and having all the space there to be able to parties and do community events I mean it, there's really a ton of synergy that made sense to us so. well fast forward and, and now we're 2019 soon to be 20 and we were talking pre this interview about arrive and, yeah. and I was like no I want to talk about Star Wars but let's talk about <laughs> arrive now I mean how exciting is that where Camelback you know the light rail and you have the full development of what's going on hopefully that'll you know kind of bring an increase and yeah and and, and it is I think there's two goals you want to go into a very populated, busy place next to a dry cleaner. Yeah. Or you want to beat <laughs> you want to beat the crew, you know, beat the scene and get there right before it happens. Right. And I think uh, I think we've been five years early, you know, and I think um, I think that the general public believes that Central ends part of the world, and then you know, from Central West is a different kind of world, and and for us being on Third Avenue and slowly extending that down. Yeah. Um, and now having more and more reasons to get down there, um, and even all the way to Seventh Avenue with, with the Melrose District and what's happening, our goal is just to get traffic, get foot traffic, get people down there discovering that yeah. some quality stuff. Down there. <clears throat> and people that are living around there, and I mean, you watch the whole development on Central and where Chula is, and mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. Huss and, yeah. and all that, and that's just been an amazing undertaking. Yeah, and I mean, people don't even remember five years ago no. that the parking lot used to be mostly empty. Yeah, yeah. no, that's it. That's exciting. So. Is there, um, do you split, obviously you do, you'll split times between Beckett's and Southern Rail, and so how, how I, does that work? I do write a schedule. Okay. And it, yeah. has, me, it <laughs> has me going to certain places um, on certain times, but um, everybody around in the kitchens knows that that's fluid because if something comes up, I gotta, you know, I gotta do it. So um, I use the analogy of I'm a firefighter and I go to the closest, hottest fire to keep the fire away from where we are. Gotcha. So I, I, um, I love being in both places. Mm -hmm. I love um, the fact that it's not, you know, five problems in one place, it's 10 problems in two places. Yeah. And when I say problems, I mean, you know, a prep list or, or you know, an event coming up or whatever. So um, for me, I live in the, you know, 16th of Bethany. So oh, yeah. I basically do a triangle. My car does a triangle every day. Yep. And uh, I don't even have to drive it anymore. It just knows where to go. It just knows where to go. Yeah, you just need one of those automated cars. Exactly. It's funny. I lived on 16th and Morton for yeah. 11 years yeah. before I got married. And now we're on 32nd and North, but that whole yeah. area right there is really cool. Well, I like it. I, I mean, uh, you know, Michelle and I say, would we ever move? And there's not really another neighborhood I want to live in. Yeah. And uh, I was, 
I'll use the word transient, but that's obviously not what I mean. But my my family, I mean, I've lived in like 30 houses by the time I was 22. Right, because so, you moved all over. Yeah, so for me, I want I wanted a, a home base for my kids through college. Stability. So they can come back and yeah. visit and have their room. And, um, and after that, who knows? I mean, maybe we'll get a flat in San Francisco and... You know, Just call it a day, yeah. right? Do you do, you do any see. gardening at home or anything as far as... Uh... I uh, I have dreams and thoughts and... And, <laughs> and aspirations. Um, aspirations. <laughs> and I also have incredible guilt for not doing it. Right. Um, but no, I most of my time at home is, is, is spent in the dark. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, I'm not really home during the day. So I wake up and, you know, we get the kids off to school and then I head to the restaurants. Yeah. So, um, and then I'm here late. Right. So the good news is I never really have to drive in traffic, but the bad news <laughs> is I'm here all the time. So yeah, and, and I know from reading some stuff that's coming up, you're you're working on more hours to be able to obviously do some stuff with your boys and kind of yeah. open that up a little yeah, bit I for mean, you. The, I, obviously, my wife and I find time to communicate, time to be together. But yeah, the boys. I mean, they're scheduled. They're up at X and they go to bed at X, and um, you know, in between they have they have school and sports and homework and all yeah. that. So so for me to find moments with them. Um, that's, that's the part of me that hates this industry, you know, is that, yeah. they say, Hey dad, are you going to be at, at soccer practice? And I'm like, no, it's Friday night and we're going to get our butts kicked at the restaurant. I right. Here. Right. So, um, finding that balance has been, always been something or has not been something I'm good at. Um, and so for me, it's, it's, it's a challenge to, to, to make those times for the kids. And it's tough, especially it's when your name is on the, you know, right. it's, it's, it's on the building. Yeah. Yeah, and it's everything, and people are coming here to taste your food and be a part of what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so 2012, you got a nomination for Food & Wine Magazine, oh, yeah. people's uh, best chef. Yeah. Um, how awesome was that? It was, was cool, and we, we tried to do a whole campaign around it. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, right then is kind of when I think Texas showed up, and Texas is incredibly... Um, they're doing a really great job of producing some amazing concepts in food right now. And, uh, <laughs> that's funny. And, and they, they tend to have, um, a lot of voters in Texas, you know? Yeah. So, so a lot of these, uh, James Beard and, and, you know, food and wine and all these nominations were just getting dominated by Texas, which, you know, they have some incredible food there. So, yeah. um, but no, that was, that was a fun nod. It was a, um, it was definitely something that the community rallied around and, and, it was a, a hot, shiny new restaurant at the time, so people were very interested in talking about it. That's great. That's yeah. great. Um, I know you're very involved with community. I know you've been on the board for the, you still may be, for the Restaurant Association, Arizona Restaurant Association. Um, and I also know that local is so important to you. Tell tell them, tell the people listening a little bit how important local is in your involvement. And well, I, I, didn't, I didn't know local was so important yeah. you know, until... Um, until I think we opened this place up and, and every time we turned around, there was a conversation or a question about, do you want this from this website or do you want this from, you know, this local person? And so we, we, it got hit into our heads so many times that this question was important that we, I think we really started, <coughs> excuse me, really started listening. Yeah. And, and when I started talking to all the people in the community, it was like, it wasn't like a scratch my back and I'll scratch yours, but it became became obvious that finance wise, community wise, um, time and energy wise, you know, big brother, little brother, friend, yeah. it became super important to really dedicate time and energy on local. And um, I've heard movements, you know, like organic should not be a word on a menu anymore. You know, everything should be organic. Local should not be on a word anymore on a menu anymore. Menu, yeah. it should be everything should be local. But um, I think. <clears throat> more so than the local, it's the community. You right. know? So if you have incredible relationships with a fisherman out in San Diego, um, yeah, you know, I mean, are you using more gas? Are you, you know, this kind of stuff. But if you're, if you're helping his family survive, if you're helping him employ people, you know, who have families, if you're supporting the way that he or she does business, um, you know, and they're not drinking Pepsi and throwing it over the, over, you know, into the right. ocean. Yeah. I mean, those are, those are the important aspects. So I don't necessarily think it has to be within 20 square miles of me. Yeah. But um, it's helpful when it is because it obviously the economy. But I really enjoy finding out how people do business. Well, I have that's, to. That's a part of it. I have to assume that also translates on the menu, on the dish, on the food, on the freshness, on you know the fact that look, organic, local. I 
I like it when it's on a menu. I see that, and I'm more prone to eat that than right. you know something that's on. Uh, it's a bad example, but Chili's menu. You know what right, I'm saying? Right. I want to support those that are here. Well, and uh, I mean, I feel like this might be like a ten beer conversation, but yeah. um, you can eat wherever you want. I mean, you have you have disposable income, and it allows you to go have dinner wherever you want, right? So you're making a choice. And sometimes that choice is, I need something in seven minutes, and I need it in a bag, yep. and I need it on the way to a, uh, an event. <laughs> okay? sure. So you should not be shamed for for needing that segment filled. Correct. Now, if your goal is to introduce your family to quality, handmade, good, local, respectful food, yeah, then going to Chili's seven days a week is, is not going to be good for your insides, and it's not going to be good for your soul. Right. Um, so it, it's about... It's about the direction you want to go. It's about the, the story you want to preach. It's about how you want to raise your family. And for me, it just feels better to eat at the parlor or to yeah. eat with Chamberlain or, or with Gio or, or, you know, over with Bernie here. It just feels you better. get to know those personalities and see those of people. Course, they, you feel like family at that point. And it point. doesn't have to be a $100 dinner. It can no. be a $15 dinner. I yeah. Mean, Gallo Blanco, I mean, you know, just, you know, yeah. I, I don't want to name all the all the chefs I'm buddies with, but it's, yeah. um, it's important that there's a moment of consciousness. That's all I'm saying. Oh, I love that, it. That goes with local, that goes with buying, that goes with eating out, that goes with choosing to support, that goes with wearing yeah. someone's shirt. I For mean, sure. It has to do with all that. Yeah, much appreciated, by the way. <laughs> um, so, uh, Devour, I know you guys, how many years have you done Devour? All of them? All of them, yeah. Yeah. I mean, back in the day when it was it was it was first starting out at the museum, and yeah, um, Kimber is is I think a very special person in a lot of people's life. Yeah, um, but she she has helped me understand and grow in that whole arena as well. And and every once in a while she'll call me and she'll say something to me, and I'm like, it's so it's so basic and simple and true. I don't know why I'm not on board with that already. And she's like, you got to do this, you got to do this, or you need help with this, or I'm a resource for this. And right. So for me, being a part of Devoured, being a part of that coalition, um, and local first, uh, it seems like a no-brainer. So when we had met for the, the fifth time and started establishing a little bit more of a relationship, we kind of had gotten into something that's really important in the hospitality industry in general, and we were talking about employees. Where do we get them? How do we find the good ones? What, what's going on right now in, in, in your mind as far as local employment and, and where you would like to see it go? Well, I, I would love to say some general statements that have impact, you know, and, and basically, you know, have periods at the end of the sentence and, and are, that's yeah, it, right? that's it, right. But there's exceptions to all the rules and, and, you know, right now the crew that I have in these restaurants are some, um, some people with character, some people with um, aspirations and skills and desire and, and when it comes down to it, I want to be slaving in the kitchen next to somebody who wants to be there. Yeah. And I understand everyone's got to have a job, everyone's got to make rent, everyone's got to have a paycheck. Um, but if you go through life just collecting a paycheck and just doing it for, um, you know, the end of the end of the month bills, I, I don't know how much happiness or joy or 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 even you know growth you'll find in that. No passion towards so, it. Yeah. So right now there is there's a lot of things going on in Arizona, and and part of it started back when we started losing some very key labor um, due to certain laws, and then also the the rise of the um, Minimum wage. Minimum wage, yeah. It's, it's, so it affects, it affects deeper than just hey, my guys were slaving away now can make more money. Right. I mean, it's you know the grocery store costs more, the movies cost more. You know all this, all ships rise in this in this case. Yeah. So for me, um, one of the reasons that we sat down and had a conversation is because I want to find ways to help to dedicate time and energy to um, sharing my experiences during hiring and interviewing and employing. Yeah. So um, I don't think everybody needs to come in in a suit and, you know, kiss my butt if they want a job. Right. Me. But I definitely think that there are things that they could do to help themselves shine and, and get better jobs that they like. What, so, what's one of those things that they should not do based on what you were telling me the other day? Didn't they ask who you were or well, if you... I mean, yeah, there's all kinds of things. But um, you probably shouldn't show up in what you were wearing last night. That's a good one. Um, you, know, you probably should shower. <laughs> you should probably know the name of the person you're coming to talk to. Right. Um, you should probably know a little bit about the restaurant you're applying at. I mean, maybe a couple menu items or the history or yeah. even just go on their website. Um, you should probably be on time. Yeah. Um, you should you should probably have 
you should figure out how you're going to differentiate yourself from someone else in a good way. Yeah, and, and, and be applying for a job that you really want, that you have a little bit of passion right. towards it, knowing that, hey, if I'm going to come in and be a server, maybe eventually I can, if I'm into cooking, I can observe and maybe be a yeah. sous chef one day and right. stuff like that and build your way up. Yeah, and, and <clears throat> I, I don't know. I've, I've not spent much of my life working in offices or even you know in a place that's <laughs> 9 to 5 or you wear yeah. a uniform, that kind of thing. But for me, I feel like restaurants are extremely fluid. Yeah. There's never boxes. It's always amoebas. And um, to walk into a restaurant and have expectations that every single thing's going to be exactly how the last restaurant was right. is, is an asinine concept. Yeah. So um, we, people in the restaurant industry are different. We're, we're a different culture. Just You're like, artists. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, yes, yeah, some, some people are. <laughs> but but I but I need I need robots and I need artists. You yeah. know, I need people who do the same thing the same way every time and it's consistent as hell and and they're machines, right? Right. And then I need people who go, Oh, the flowers outside and it's amazing, you have to do it like this and yeah. you know, I need both those brains in my establishment. So where do you so, find those people nowadays? Um, it's hard. It's hard. A lot of it's word of mouth. Yeah. Um a lot of the the cooks and, you know, front house people in each restaurant are friends with other, and, you know, so it's kind of the, the game where it just spreads out, um, word of mouth. But the other part is just, you know, reaching out through the paper or online or um, through Local First or just having, yeah. but that's what our conversations stem down to is right. how we reach the right people. <clears throat> and, and what's going on with the with the culinary scene in, in Arizona? And, and you would think it would be a great feeder to restaurants around here, but w what's going on with all that? You mean the, the schools? The yeah, education? the schools out here. And well, there's definitely less schools than there used to be. Yeah. Um, and and I think I I can only speak for me, and and I will tell you that four days out of high school, I was in culinary school, and it was a tremendous foundation for me. Yeah. But um, my school was only eighteen grand, and it was an eighteen month program, and I I was in school for eight hours, and then I stayed there and worked for another four to eight hours. Yeah. So I literally spent five, six days a week just immersing myself in it. It was almost as if it was an externship and schooling at the same time. Yeah. So for me, that foundation is what I wanted, what I needed, and and a hundred percent where I should and wanted to be. Right. So I think um, some of my experiences with some people who are coming out of school now are it's either a second career or they had this this um, scholarship and they had to use it up or um, you know, their parents didn't really, they said they had to go to school and this seemed like the easiest way out. <laughs> um, and some schools now are, are part-time to the point where it's two or three days a week and then some online classes. And for me, the most important part about cooking is, is cooking. Yeah. I mean, you have to do, I'll write new menu dishes and it's not until the fourth or fifth time that I'm like, that's the one. That's, that's what, it. right. It's that's the experience. The it's actually doing it. Yeah. yeah. And food's not box i mean it's changes no. every time you touch it no i i mean uh, even yeah th 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 that's so true because not every until you really get your dish down and you know i mean it's measurements and yep. it's it's everything and then being able Finesse. to teach that and relay exactly. that yeah i don't even think i answered your question i think i went no that's all right different, yeah you know i went all the way out to the 303 and did a whole loop around that, Phoenix, that's okay so. we don't need to answer questions we don't need answers <laughs> it's all good <laughs> um are you What's what's your input so far on what's going on, like 2018, 2019, the future of 20? I mean, you see all these restaurants that are opening up. And I would assume, I mean, to you, to me, to people that are living in Arizona, it's it's pretty exciting. I mean, you see a lot of new developments, this and that. Um, but you also see quite a few that are closing. Um, how do you think that's going to go, like, going forward, you know? Well, um it's interesting. I feel I feel two ways about it. I really do. And there's probably some gray area in between. Yeah. So, um, I had a chef once pull me aside and say, we have six or we have 3,000 seats in this in this corner, in these four corners of restaurant space that are open seven nights a week. Mm -hmm. It doesn't include lunch. So if every restaurant gets one person per seat, that's 3,000 thousand people just on that corner yeah. of Phoenix yeah. that need their, you know, that have to, to fill their restaurants. So when you look at it that way, wow. you think, how the heck is any restaurant going to stay alive? You're right. right. Yeah. And most restaurants um, obviously would prefer to have 
you know, two or three seatings in each of their chairs. Yeah. So, for instance, we have 127 seats. So, if we're doing 250, 300, 400 covers a night, that's that's a really good bottom line. You know, that that, that makes sense. Right. Um, but if you have 120 seats and you only fill 30 of them, you know, that affects the bottom line. It affects... Anyway, so... So in one sense, I feel like there's a lot. There's a lot of saturation. But the problem is, is it's not all the same kind of restaurant. Right. right? You have a sports bar. You have a high end. You have a casual. You have Hokey a bar. Spot, you yeah. have a to-go spot. Yeah. yeah. Something. Um, so in essence, that, that concept is flawed because on any given night, if you have 100 people on a school bus, not all of them want Poke Bowl. Not all of them want pizza. Not all of them want Chinese. Yeah. So our concept with Beckett's was to have enough things on the menu that that 100-person bus can all eat here. And enjoy, you know, yeah. Grumpy so-and-so wants a burger, they can have a burger. You know, adventurous so-and-so wants this, they can have that. Yeah. Um, you know, a person who doesn't really eat something can just have a salad, you know? So, like, there's there's plenty to, to, to choose from on the menu. So to go back to answer your question, um, on one sense, I think we're oversaturated. On the other sense, I think it's an incredible explosion of concepts and talent and and introducing Phoenix, which in the is, is history dictates has not been especially adventurous either. Right. Yeah. I mean, when I moved here, you know, it was Christopher and Tarbell and Roxanne and Eddie and a handful. And yeah, that was it. That was it. Vincent, you know, I mean, those were the godparents of the yeah. culinary in, in Arizona. So, um, we've come a long way. We're going in the right direction. Yeah. Um, I think we're casting a wide net and we're going to find out what works and smart restaurant tools tours will be here to continue to do that. Yeah. And people that, um, you know, make good lasagna and should open a restaurant probably won't. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not trying to be a dick. I'm just saying, you're like, just saying, yeah, it, it takes a lot to run these businesses. Oh, I, you know, even from my aspect, I'll get calls from people. And it was funny. I heard you talking a little bit earlier in the kitchen and I'll get calls from people that are like, yeah, we're it guys. And, and, you know, or I, or, you know, um, whatever craft you know craft maker people and we're going to open up this really cool wine bar or this really awesome restaurant right. i'm like cool i go i'm going to do you a favor i want you to give me five thousand dollars i'll throw it away for you and then yeah and then basically i'm going to tell you not to do it right. you know because it's just the amount of work and not just getting it open but all the after work that comes after it i i think a lot of people just lose sight on like Oh wait a minute! We actually have to work at this, right. and year after year, it just never stops. So it's. I used to I used to think that um, that having good people um, and a good system in a good building would produce the end result every time. Yeah. But what I realized, and and you know, my dad was an electrician for Georgia Pacific, um, and he would get calls at midnight because. <laughs> Even the most consistent, most stable, most durable machines would break down. Would break down, yeah. So um, it's the same thing, I think, at restaurants where even if a guy's having a bad day, that affects the flow. Yeah. And it, and it, and it you know, if you think about it, how a restaurant operates today is affected by what was ordered earlier in the week, the attitude of the person doing the orders. Right. Um, you know, uh, did you pay, did the accountant pay the electric bill? Yeah. You know, I mean, there are so many things that go to getting food on the table and you leaving happy Yeah. that, um, it, it's not, it's not press a button to start and press a button to end. There's, you know, it's a, so it's a many computer. things to go into it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Wow. Um, so you started doing cooking classes here. Mm -hmm. How, how's it going so far? So we just did one, our first one. And uh, my whole goal was to activate this space and, and to use cooking classes as, as a form of outreach. Yeah. So I love cooking classes. I love teaching. I love showing people food. I, I love convincing people who hate to cook that cooking is fun, you know, or, love at, least, it. Yeah. or at least rewarding. Um, so we did a cooking class. We did 24 people. We did it lunchtime on Saturday. <coughs> Excuse me. I showed them all how to make fresh pasta, yeah. and then we ate salads and pasta and desserts and drank some wine together, and um, it was a really fun class. It was a really fun day. So we have committed to doing other dates, and, and we're going to produce those through our social media. And, and I mean, it's it's a part of who I am and what I do is yeah. training. 
and, and teaching yeah. and sharing with the community. So again, it's just another part of my commitment. Well, it's an, yeah, it's you opening up more of your passion and sharing it with others around here. And then just creating more of that community connectivity. And it's like, you know, people are going to talk about it and right. bring more people. Well, it goes back to responsibilities. I mean, yeah. I'm in charge of making sure that every, every dish that hits the table is delicious and rewarding and yeah. exciting and worth what the people are paying. But I also owe, I've been re respected and treated well and, and given chances yeah. um, throughout my career during Arizona. And it's it's part of my mission and my goal to be part of the community. and Not give back necessarily, but but to be available and to be out there. Was your um was your younger part of your restaurant life a little bit wilder than your now part? Are you saying I'm not wild and crazy right now? Well, I, you know. No. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, um, <laughs> so I didn't go to college. Yeah. And I, you know, I went right from high school into, and I've never been a party kid. Yeah. Um, but I think that my, you know, sous chef, early chef days were definitely my college years. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I like to, you know, drive a fast car and, you know, all the things that chefs do, you know, when you get out at 10 or 11 o'clock at night, there's, there's nothing to do. We're young men. Yeah. yeah. So it was, um, it was fun and, and I learned a lot of lessons and, and I even see it now, you know, in, in younger people that are, that come across our paths, but, yeah. but it's different now. I think, I think it's, it's more, um, it's less about going out to a bar and meeting people. It's more about how you interact, you know, Completely. electronically and, yeah. and kind of connect that way and, Interesting. Do you notice a lot of people, even when they come to a nice restaurant like this, like on their phones a lot? Or yeah, I mean, um, I think it's I think it's part of the culture now. I yeah. don't think it's something you know. I've heard fun things where you stack the phones in the middle, and the first person to check, you know, pays the bill and that kind of stuff. But that's cool. Um, I also feel hypocritical because I tell my kids, you know, no more technology. You've had your you know your hour for the day or whatever it is. Yeah. But Michelle and I are, <coughs> excuse me, constantly on our phones. Yeah. You know we're posting on social media we're checking you're emails. working we're, we're working totally but um <laughs> yeah it's it's um it's challenging and there there's you know when i was a kid we used to have to look in the phone book for something yeah you know, but you we learn how to embrace it we had pagers respect. we had the big phones i, I mean pager. Yeah, I did too. I still know my number. That's how crazy oh. it was. <laughs> yeah. Well, so so people that don't know you um a little synopsis of each one of your restaurants and, and what they could expect if they wanted to come and, and eat there. Okay, yeah. So Southern Rail, um, we just had our, we're about five and a half years old. And, um, you know, when we started that restaurant, our mission was to create Southern food um, and, and introduce it to Arizona and to make sure that they understood that, you know, dark roux and gravies and, and all this stuff is really important. Yeah. Um, but that, that tended to, I think it was confusing for people. So right now it's, uh, you know, seasonal American cooking with, with, with influences from the South. Okay. So we have our fried chickens and our fried green tomatoes and our fermento cheese, mm. um, which is all absolutely delicious and craveable. But I think the biggest misnomer about the South is the community in the South is all about barter and trade and, hey, you give me, a, you know, a jar of peach jam and I'll give you my fresh collard greens. Collard greens, yeah. And, and what I discovered eating all through the South was how important vegetables were and how you touch the vegetables and produce the vegetables. So for me, my discovery with Southern Rail was, was you know, bringing people into the vegetable side of Southern, which has been really a lot of fun. That's cool. So we're open for lunch and dinner every day. Okay. We do a brunch on the weekends. Um, the beverage program, had an outstanding bourbon program. Okay. Um, and local Arizona wine program. Yeah. Too. So we've been, uh, you know, given quite a few nods for how incredible the Arizona wine list is there. Congrats. Um, that restaurant has been amazingly, um, you know, it's just been great for events. So we do our Mardi Gras and we do our, our jazz and jambalayas in the falls and the spring where on Sunday nights you listen to jazz and, and you eat some great spicy jambalaya. Yeah. Um, so we, we have so many thematic events that are incredibly delicious and, and great fun. I can attest to the jambalaya. I've had yeah. it and it's really good. It's, it's yeah. fun. So um, we always have something going on at Southern Rail. Cool. And then, you know, spending the day at the bookstore. Yeah, you're right, right next to a nice bookstore and do your thing. Our social incredible. Our bar is amazing. Patio is beautiful. So awesome. that's Southern Rail. Um, and that's at 3rd Avenue in Camelback in, in the new. So um, Beckett's Table, uh, we're coming up on our ninth anniversary here next month. So um, that's going to be a fun a fun hoopla, if you will. Right on. Um, 
And Beckett's table has always been based off the fact that we're going to throw a dinner party and we hope the neighborhood shows up. Love it. So, yeah. So, you know, how we built the kitchen kind of sticking out into the dining room. Kind of see what's um, going on. Yeah. And, and wh when you come over to my house for a dinner party, where do you end up? You end up in the kitchen, right? Asking me questions, that kind of stuff. So we kind of wanted to mimic that here. But this, this location has been a restaurant for 40 years. And we were the first people to ever take it down to the wall. What was this before? So it was uh, Nick's. It was Big Sky Bakery. It was um, That's Italiano. Mary Coyle's original Oh, my location. God. So, and we discovered all this stuff by kind of taking apart piece by yeah. piece. Yeah. And, you know, the bow truss ceilings and the, the, the environment, the way it feels in here, the way it smells when you walk in, yeah. um, is all part of kind of the vision and the culture. But um, seasonal American cooking. Okay. Uh, I was ignorant in the sense that when I was growing up as a chef, I believed that menus were dictated by proteins and how you wanted them in and out of the menu. Yeah. Um, in my belief right now, menus 100% should be dictated by the local produce. So this goes back to, you know, caveman days or whatever when, you know, in the winter, citrus grows. What, do you, what does your body need in the winter? Vitamin C. Vitamin C. So in the summer, we need water we need hydration yep. so melons and, and lettuces and you know things like that so we base our menu five six times a year changes um on what and what's growing local you know what's what's coming out of the ground what our body's craving and and we just play with food and have fun now um as much as i think the food is important here uh you know our service and our beverage program are um, yeah also huge components of what we do and we realized in the very beginning that there were plenty of restaurants that you could go to and they would tell you to F off and, you know, no, you can't substitute this and you can't have this and I don't care about your allergies and I don't care about your reactions. Um, and from day one, our goal was to never say no whenever possible. That's awesome. And that's a big statement, especially coming from a chef that's like, these are my dishes, well, you know. Yeah. Of course I'd love to tell you to eat it how it is. Right. But if, if you tell me that you're going to be sick on the toilet all night <laughs> if, you, you know, if you eat this bread, then of course you should eat something good for you and we'll yeah. make it work. Um, yeah. And that's and, and now I think that's a place that people rely on because they feel safe coming here. I love that. For that. Yeah. Um, and and also I, I I think that you know as a moment of pause and something that's really extremely important is is the wine cellar over there. Yeah. And you know you look at it and you think oh it's a you know it's a room with wine in it but it's the right temperature. It's I mean every bin in there has been personally tasted by Scott and Katie and and and. And that wine has to make sense in that bottle from the place it's coming from and what the mission is, you know? Uh, and, and they've always told me that the wine needs to complement the food. Mm -hmm. And um, I've, I've, I've taken that very, very personally because I think it's incredible that they're willing to, you know, have things in the house that go with our cooking style. But also the awards that, that seller gets on a, on a on yeah. an annual basis. Yeah, it's a very important part of your business. Through the roof. It's yeah. unbelievable. So we sell a lot of wine here. Um, you know, we also obviously have a strong cocktail program, and 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 the thing the thing about Beckett's is that you come in here for an experience and you leave feeling warm and fuzzy. Yeah. You know, and that's that's more than just food or wine or service. It's it's the experience. Yeah. No. I, the, the, so Beckett's Southern Rail. You're doing cooking classes. What's next? Anything? You good for now? Um, I mean, I'm. I keep my days very busy. I mean, yeah. I don't. I don't need another thing on my plate. <laughs> but uh, you, you have know, to get approached, though. I mean, yeah, and and, and I think, um, you know, I think every commercial real estate person will send me an email <laughs> with uh, the perfect property, and, right? And um, you know, we'll do whatever it takes to get you in this location. Yeah. And <clears throat> and I think when we did, uh, when we made the commitment to go to Southern Rail, it was very circumstantial, right? It was the right property, the right partners. Um, the right part of town, like, you know, a year early, two years early, you know, we wanted to be in first. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really important for us. And now I think, um, you know, we believe that there are concepts within Southern Rail that have legs, you know, so focus on the po boys or focus on, you know, <coughs> excuse me, some farmer market components with, with right. some goods that we can sell there. Yeah. Um, we also believe that, you know, Beckett's Table could, could have another location in town, um, you know, sure. it's the right spot and the right people. Um, so I'm not telling you we're not looking. I'm not telling you we have the least. Yeah. Um, I think it's a scary time in the restaurant industry, and I think For that sure. we're, we're really focused in doing what we do well and keeping it al alive and, and healthy and happy, you know, in a, in a time when we're not the new shiny penny. Right. Um, 
but I also I also have you know lots of hopes and dreams and, and yeah. excitement about other things too. So. That's cool. You're still young. I mean, we're both still young. It's yeah. like ah, we're always you One know with that with that drive. Yeah, just a few. You know, in dog years. Um, okay, so a couple quick fire questions um, to just ask you to kind of wrap this thing up. So, who would win in a fight, Bruce Lee or Rambo? Uh, does Rambo have weapons? Oh, of course. Uh, maybe Rambo. Yeah. But I want Bruce Lee to win. I know you do. I, I know do. you. I know you really like Bruce Lee. Not just because he's from San Francisco. <laughs> I mean, if Chuck Norris were involved, it would be Chuck Norris. Oh, it would be because I almost put Chuck Norris in there, and yeah. I wasn't sure. Well, I was he, like, it's a slam. He wins every time. Definitely Chuck. Okay, gotcha. If you're going to go to a game, is it the 49ers or the Giants? Mm, I have not been to a game at the new stadium at uh, 49ers New Stadium, so probably 49ers. Hi. But I do watch every single Giants game. Uh, I have a little app, and I every single game, 162 games, I watch. No kidding. Yeah. How does that work while you're cooking? You just got to. Well, I usually watch it delayed. Oh, when I get gotcha. Home and I have yeah. It on and yeah, I, I know plenty of Dimebacks fans who are going to be upset at me about this, but um, <laughs> they usually don't watch a lot of games. So I have yeah. one up on them is that I'm actually a true fan. That's like your Zen place. You just yeah. you have okay. it recorded. That's... And the older I get, the more I like to listen to it. Right. Right. When I was a kid, oh, I used totally. to always tease my uncle, like, how can you listen to a sporting event? And now I love the commentary. I Isn't it great? Yeah. Sport. My dad still has old reels that I actually put on. Um, you know, uh, MP3 or whatever. Right. They're old, literally reels. So you can see the tape. I mean, from the oh uh, the 60, 40s, from the 40s of Mets games. So I got it done, and he need, now gets to listen to those from when he was a kid. You can hear his voice as a kid in the background. It's crazy. Shea Stadium was my first uh, my first baseball game. Oh, very cool. Yeah. yeah, I went there as a kid too. I, I love that stadium. Um, what you, if, if you had a choice between running three miles or biking ten miles, what would you do? I don't know. I've never really been a big biker, so I would okay. say probably running. Good. Um, I remember as a kid having a BMX bike and yeah. loving that kind of aspect, but that's not the same as a road biker. No. Long so there's a possibility I could get you out for a 5K one weekend. <laughs> I did one once, yeah. <laughs> um, dogs or cats? Dogs, 100%. 100%. 100%. Uh, Disney or camping? I do like camping, but it has to be like glamping. Yeah. Like, I want cast iron skillets i want a full stove out there i want to, the best part about camping is just the quiet and then eating right right so, so do you cook when you camp absolutely yeah 100%. that's great yeah. no i don't take a you know a fishing vest and beef jerky no i'm like i bring extension cords and you you're know, ready to go yeah. yeah that's cool I, I've, I've done disney disney a couple times i feel like when you get home from disney you need to like Go camping. Totally. Four hour showers. Well, they do have the Millennium Falcon at Disney now. I know, so I am excited. We're going to do that someday. Yeah, we're going to so. go in October. Ooh, nice. Um, okay, and then the last one: bananas or chocolate crickets? Are you kidding? Are you messing with me? Right I'm now? messing with. You. Okay. Do you know my thing about bananas? <laughs> I read about it. Okay. No, I'll, I'll read anything about bananas. <laughs> I don't even want a banana in the same room. No bananas. Zero. <laughs> No. I was dying laughing when I heard that. I well, had a server sit down for pre shift the other day, and they had a banana, and I'm like, get, get it out of here. Get out of here. That's the one thing, yeah. Oh, that's great. That is great. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time and, and being on the podcast. It, um, I know you're on social media. You guys yeah. are active on there, so Instagram, Facebook, whole okay. nine yards. All okay. Yeah. Um, we, uh, I, I try to take as much content as I can personally, yeah. and then... Um, Michelle turns it into amazing posts on a, on a daily, and she she takes it very seriously. I mean, it's not it's not posts when you can. It's you know a regiment of a yeah. couple times a day and interactions and replying to every post and review and so it's all it's, it's awesome. All part of it. Yeah, it's just part of the business now, yep. which is great. So yeah, thank you again. Um, I hope you guys all enjoyed this podcast and. Uh, Please, you know, subscribe if you have not yet. Uh, give it, leave us a five star. Follow us on Instagram. Follow local four eight zero on Instagram, and check out the new website that we have, the barrestaurantpodcast.com. So, until next time, uh, this is the Delo, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Peace. Yeah.